brilliant. Thanks so much, Wes. Now my here my kia ora koto. Welcome and greetings to you all from here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I would like to begin by recognizing Naitahu Riri, who hold the Manafinawa here in Otutahi Christchurch, and who are the kaitiaki, or the guardians of the land that I call home here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I would also like to begin by honoring the indigenous peoples, not only of this Finawa, but across the world for their knowledge and for their resilience. And today, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Interest Group here at ASOL is very happy to bring you this most excellent panel and quite timely panel, as Wes has already said, on Indigenous peoples and constitutional reforms, focusing in this panel on Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Before we begin, Harry Hobbs, who is my co-chair and I, would like to begin by thanking all of our panelists for joining us here today and giving up their time to speak on this important topic, and to ASIL as well for supporting this event. And finally, of course, we would also like to thank uh, the audience out there in, in Zoom land out in cyberspace for joining us here today uh, as well. Uh, a little housekeeping for our event here today. Uh, the running order is as follows. First, we will hear from Valmain Toki. Uh, she will be followed by Danny Larkin. And then we also have a third panelist who will hopefully be joining us a bit later, uh, Darcy Lindbergh as well. Uh, each panelist will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and then after all of our lovely panelists have spoken, we'll then open up the floor uh, for questions. And hopefully we would like to leave about 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions uh, at the end and generate some good conversation between panelists and um, the audience as well. Uh, we'll begin, as I said, with Valmain. Valmain is a professor of law here in Aotearoa, New Zealand at Waikato. Uh, she was the first Māori and the first New Zealander appointed as an expert uh, member on the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Uh, Valmain is also a barrister and a solicitor of the High Court here in New Zealand and has assisted in cases uh, in the Māori Land Court, uh, the Environmental Court and the High Court. So Valmain, with that said, I will go ahead and turn over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, kia ora. Um... Good morning, everyone. Um, evening in other places of our, of our globe. It's a privilege to be on this panel. First, I'd like to acknowledge my Indigenous brothers and sisters, including those that have passed and the Tangata Whenua or peoples of the land. Second, I'm humbled to be amongst fellow panellists, including um, Danny and uh, Darcy when he pops on. And thirdly, uh, a really big mihi to Shia and Harry from the American Society of International Law for this um, invitation. I understand our panel is to take stock and assess how the fundamental rights articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are recognized in our respective constitutions. And if I can uh, just share my screen, I've got a very short PowerPoint um, hopefully, that I wanted to, to accompany my presentation this morning or evening. So uh, by way of outline, I wanted to look at some current examples. And these are this is really to, to set the scene. So I was going to briefly mention what's happening in the Philippines, acknowledge briefly what the movements in Canada, and I know that Darcy will probably pick that up a lot more, and what's happening here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Secondly, uh, set that up very brief, briefly against the challenges for Indigenous peoples, including what's happening in Brazil very briefly, and then also look at what's, what's ahead. First, to provide a recent positive example of incorporating the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we can look to the Philippines. In January 2019, the Banks of Moral Organic Law was ratified by the residents of that autonomous region. Population is about 4 million, um, and this Bank for Moro Autonomous Region was created. After decades of armed conflict, what this did, it provided a window of opportunity and also challenges to introduce robust pieces of legislation, such as the proposed Indigenous Peoples' Rights Bill, within a region that faced you know, a myriad of hurdles, including armed conflict, and also a poverty incident rate of about 60-63%. On a positive note, this proposed Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act within the Banks of Moro Autonomous Region 
It's uh, comprehensive, it's well written, and it's extensive and it includes many of the rights articulated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that we all know serves as a benchmark for internationally accepted standards against which Indigenous peoples measure that state action, action against. This Indigenous Peoples Rights Bill recognises and reflects the context of the Banks of Mora peoples. So for instance, we all know that Article 3 of the Declaration is a key right and that's the right of self-determination being a key right on which all other rights derive, right? So the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Bill in the Banks of Moira region places this chapter on self-determination after the right to ancestral domains. So placing the rights to ancestral domains before the right of self-determination, what this does, it underscores the importance of ancestral lands to the Banks of Moira peoples. In addition, a discrete chapter provides rights during armed conflict together with a section on rights during armed conflict within the social justice and human rights chapter. So again, these little changes or I suppose big changes when you think about the context of the indigenous peoples within the Banks of Moro region, it, re it reflects an important contextual element for those Banks of Moro peoples. When we look at the language of the bill, it's quite open-ended. So it includes phrases like, but not limited to, um, when referring to, for example, Indigenous peoples, that's quite welcomed because they uh, provides an opportunity to import other international instruments that, that support Indigenous rights. Comparatively, this Indigenous Peoples' Rights Bill is more advanced in many jurisdictions, including that here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that we don't include those fundamental rights within our legislative framework. The, the uh, free, prior and informed consent definition within this bill is also quite extensive and elaborates to include free from external manipulation in a language and process understand, understandable to them, which although when we think about the definition of FPIC, they should, that should be, that language should be implicit, including that language within the definition section of the bill provides certainty. So this, this bill, it's um, current, it's a uh, well-written, progressive and reflects the context of Indigenous peoples and importantly for the purposes of our webinar this morning reflects the those fundamental rights articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Turning very br briefly to Canada I won't um, mention I won't sort of dwell on that because I know um, another panelist will probably pick up uh, on this in more more in depth but just to acknowledge that the Bill C-15 and I've got some language on the screen, which is uh, the focus of the bill. So the Canadian government's required to examine federal laws, policies and practices to take all measures in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples and to do what? To ensure consistency with the declaration. So although I think this is a really positive and welcome step, when you put that against that proposed Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act in the Banks of Morrow Autonomous Region, that clearly prescribes fundamental rights within the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. You can see when we start this comparative exercise, it, this um, welcome step in Canada, I think, falls short. Uh, Congo Brazil, I just wanted to mention that very quickly. They were very progressive in 2010. They took steps to include the declaration within their constitution. Jim and I, who was the then Special Rapporteur, made comment on that progressive step. I'll, I'll leave that there. I know that I'm, I've only got a short amount of time. I wanted to quickly um, mention uh, Bolivia before I turn to look at Aotearoa New Zealand. And just to say they also have embraced fundamental rights articulated in the declaration within their constitution. Um, we know that indigenous peoples are the majority in Bolivia. So consequently we get more of that perspective of Indigenous peoples reflected meaningfully within the Bolivian constitution. To end this current section um, in Aotearoa New Zealand, what's happening here, we have an unwritten constitution where the Treaty of Waitangi or Te Tiriti of Waitangi, an agreement between Indigenous peoples Māori and the Crown, it's considered a constitutional canon. Despite this, uh, we look at those disproportionate social statistics haven't changed. So for instance, Māori, the Indigenous peoples in Aotearoa New Zealand 
who comprise about 15% of the general population. Yet when we look at our prisons, we're 50% for Māori men, for women, up to 60%. And this has remained the same for, you know, in excess of 40 years. This disproportionate statistic is not distinct to us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but unfortunately shared amongst many of my Indigenous brothers and sisters across many jurisdictions, including uh, Canada and also Australia. So I mentioned that Canada's Bill C-15, by introducing that, what that has done, it's placed pressure on our government here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, to meaningfully progress implementing the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we sort of see an analogy, right, with the original adoption of the, in the General Assembly uh, that happening here. So although our current Labour government is no longer restricted by our coalition partner, the government is taking, you know, small, small, but I think um, progressive steps to recognise fundamental rights such as teruranga, teratanga for Māori. Uh, what this looks like, I think, is yet to be determined, but that engagement with iwi leaders that the government is undertaking to meaningfully take steps to recognise declaration, I think, you know, that's that's a promising, a promising start. Uh, last week, um, the 28th of October, 18, was an anniversary date for He Whakaputinga, which is our Declaration of Independence, entered, in between, entered into between 52 Māori chiefs in the North and the King, uh, proclaiming independence uh, for Māori. So I mentioned that as another instrument where Māori have always asserted their self-determination, independence, or tēnaranga tēratanga. So we not only have this Declaration of Independence, but we have the treaty also recognizing our independence and also Article 30, Article 3 of the Declaration. So collectively, it shows that we have always uh, ascribed to Tinoranga Tira or self determination. So my point uh, is, is that do we need a, an instrument to clearly articulate self determination? Or shouldn't that right exist irrespective of being captured in a in a in a in a discrete in a discrete um, instrument? And I know that uh, Jim and I, has, who was a special rapporteur on the rights of Indigenous peoples, has famously said, "Just just do it. You know, just use those rights. Uh, they they're fundamental rights, and they should exist irrespective of being captured in to a an instrument." Um, challenges. I don't know how I'm running for time, but I, I think I must be drawing towards the end here. Our challenges are what happens when those fundamental rights aren't articulated in respective constitutions. We look at Brazil. Uh, what happens there is Indigenous peoples, they take other actions. So the Exacrio peoples alongside other Indigenous brothers and sisters in Brazil recently marched to denounce that historical assault, the historic sorry, assault on their native lands. The Supreme Court heard arguments for and against that cutoff date for land claims that are vital for the survival of Indigenous peoples. This would require recognition of Indigenous rights to land occupied prior to 1988 when the Constitution was ratified. Indigenous peoples and rights groups are arguing that applying this cutoff date of 1988, what this does, it erases Indigenous claims across Brazil dating back to the 1950s when they were removed from their lands by those tobacco farmers, miners, and logging operators. Unfortunately, uh, Brazil's Supreme Court recently suspended the case with no new date for when uh, it, will, it will revisit the matter. So I raise that as an example of what, what do, where do Indigenous peoples go when those rights, fundamental rights articulated in the Declaration aren't meaningfully recognized. They go, they protest, they go to the Supreme Court, and yet that isn't taken up or reflected Within the within the constitution, uh, briefly uh, a nod to our indigenous rights defenders. We know they stand up for indigenous rights, protecting our land, culture, and way of life. This often leads to harassment, criminal charges, and even murder. Um, in in Colombia, they they do amazing work. Also close to home in the Pacific, we see this happening in West Papua. And when pro independence voices are imprisoned. I think we need more than that soft diplomacy that we're seeing from the New Zealand government uh, with respect to what's the situation in West Papua and their fundamental rights being breached. What we need is a support for a, for a UN investigation. So I suppose the challenges, 
and I think um, I've alluded to that in my brief presentation, is political will, right? So we need um, to lobby, on the next slide, we need to lobby our states, our governments to um, insist or um, turn their mind to meaningfully implementing these fundamental rights. So that we know the declaration doesn't create new rights, they're fundamental rights, they're right to culture, right to education, but we need those incorporated within our constitution and with in New, Alter New Zealand within our unwritten constitution. Uh, and how do we do that? Advocacy, right? There are three UN mandated bodies with a focus on indigenous rights. So special rapporteur who I've mentioned the expert mechanism is another, and the third one, of course, is a permanent forum. So we need to continue, continue that continual advocacy within perhaps those three UN bodies, but also, you know, um, a locally at home. So as an academic in our teaching and our writing, but, you know, I think political lobbying is, is really the key. That's where all the action happens. That's where the wheelhouse is in terms of trying to uh, prescribe or include those fundamental rights. How am I going for time, Cher? Am I done? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Oh, great. So, uh, so yeah. So, um, I think I think it's really important. And I've gone through my presentation really quickly, but I'm hoping that I can elaborate on some of those key those key points um, during uh, question answers. Um, and just returning to what's happening here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, tino ranga, tino tanga, you know, we practice it every day, right? So whether it's in a, uh, a small, in a small way, so speaking our language at home, our te reo at home, whether it's in a larger way within our, within our iwi with, or in our iwi groups or our hapu groups, the way we, we, we handle our people, the way we, um, we deal with our health issues. So for instance, with COVID-19, we have decided to um, put in our own roadblocks to ensure safety to our vulnerable communities. And that's an example of, you know, uh, I suppose, walking the talk. So when we can't have those fundamental rights articulated within our unwritten constitution, Indigenous peoples, we just, we just do it ourselves, right? We just, we just do it. So I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there and provide more space for our other panellists. Thanks, Carmaine. That was fantastic. A really great overview of uh, Indigenous advocacy for constitutional reform. Uh, not just in Aotearoa, but in South America, Africa, and Asia. So thank you very much. The, the, I know it's only short, but that was fantastic. Um, uh, just because I'm first talking, first time talking today, I just want to say that I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I'm uh, joining you from today. I'm on the Gadigal land of the Eora people. Uh, pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, moving on now to, uh, we've got Dr. Dani Larkin from the University of New South Wales. So Dani is a Bundjalung Kukungari woman from Grafton, New South Wales, and public lawyer. Dani is a legal academic and advocate for constitutional reform and political empowerment of First Nations, and her research interests include Indigenous self-determination and cultural identity, electoral law and policy reform, Indigenous political participation, comparative constitutional law and international human rights, and she's the Deputy Director at the Indigenous Law Centre uh, and a lecturer at Nurugili here in Sydney. Um, and we're very happy to have Dani here today, so thank you, Dani. Thanks, Harry, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for dialing in today. And um, for listening to this discussion. We had some um, great points that were raised by Balmain and um, I can certainly see the sort of connections that we have here with the issues and self-determination um, issues, constitutional issues that we have here in Australia. Um, so before I start, I'd just like to pay my respects to elders past and present from the land I'm dialing in, in from today. Um, so I'm on Gadigal country in Sydney, the same with Harry. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you all about the process to date pre and post the gifting of the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the Australian people. So this particular topic is important in contemporary politics in Australia right now. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is a political statement and call to action by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander authority, cultural authority, elders and significant community representatives to the Australian government to deliver on substantive structural reform proposals that would not only benefit First Nations, but provide recognition of our substantive rights and place in this country as First Peoples and make meaningful change to our lives. 
Australia, unlike most many Commonwealth countries with similar colonial pasts, does not have treaties in place, nor does it have a national strategy for truth-telling or constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's rights and status as First Peoples. In fact, the strategy has been for many years for the Australian government to can kick the issue of ever affording Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with substantive rights and representative mechanisms and legislative tools to protect their rights and cultural identity. So I'll I'll commence and jump straight into the the lead up to the um, authorship and, and gifting of the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the Australian people. So it began in 2016. So in 2016, the Referendum Council coordinated a series of regional meetings, which we call the regional dialogues, And they were held across Australia and involved First Nation elders, traditional owners, community organisations and key individuals. So the Referendum Council, that was formed in 2015 and that was as a response to proposals of symbolism and minimalistic forms of Indigenous constitutional recognition that had been an ongoing issue since Australia's 1999 referendum, which failed but it proposed at that referendum to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the preamble of the Australian Constitution. So that proposal emerged again in 2015 when the Recognise campaign in Australia took off and it didn't have any model on the table for Indigenous constitutional recognition. And so at that point in time, many were concerned that we were headed down the road of symbolism again and the view from community was that a statement of recognition or amending the race power within the Australian Constitution, so Section 5126, or deleting Section 25 of the Australian Constitution, provision as to race is disqualified from voting, all of those things wouldn't be enough. So First Nation people and communities in Australia wanted substantive reform to change the governance structure and political culture of Australian law and policy making practices for the benefit and political empowerment of First Nation people. And so the Referendum Council was formed to commence a new process that would go out and actually test the sentiment amongst First Nation people and communities about the question of constitutional reform. And then it would then be responsible for advising the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition on next steps towards a successful referendum on Indigenous constitutional recognition. So as I've mentioned, the regional dialogues commenced in 2016. Um, Attendance to those dialogues was by invitation only, but that tactic was only to ensure that each dialogue was actually deliberative and it actually reached a consensus um, on whether and if so how Um, to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Australian Constitution. So after the regional dialogues had finished in 2016, um, right up to even the start of 2017, in 2017 um, those regional dialogues and their priorities were all reported to a First Nations Constitutional Convention, which was held at Uluru from the 23rd to the 26th of May. So that convention produced the Uluru Statement from the Heart 2017 and it includes three deliberately sequenced priorities of reforms. So those reforms are first, a constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice to parliament. Second, a Makarata commission, which would set up the process for agreement making or treaty making. So Makarata is a Yolnu word for coming together after a struggle. And the third thing that it set out was truth-telling. Now, in this same year, the Referendum Council publishes its final report on all of those findings um, from the Uluru Convention. Um, Now, what was really um, important about this process or I suppose significant was that it was the first of its kind to ever occur in Australia. It was, unfortunately so, um, the first time we saw regional meetings of guided political thought, and debate where First Nation people could determine for themselves how they ought to be recognised in this country. Um, And and what was also significant was that interpreters were used so that elders and traditional owners could speak in their traditional language to one another, which was for Australia um, truly remarkable to see given our history um, and legislative limitations imposed upon us as a people to practise our culture in that way and speak our language. 
Now, after that convention and the issuing of the Uluru Statement from the Heart to the Australian people, so it was deliberately issued to the Australian people as a gift and an invitation to walk with us as part of a people's movement for structural reform, not to the Australian government. Um, so then as many statements um, which have been presented to the government um, in Australia from First Nation people, they're usually uh, not really acted on from prime ministers um, and they're kept in or well, they're locked away in glass cabinets in Parliament House, never to sort of be referred to again. So it was deliberately issued to the Australian people for those reasons. But um, after that, our Prime Minister at the time, who was Malcolm Turnbull, rejected its reform proposal, which was the primary, it's, it's known as the spirit of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and that was the constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament. Um, so it's the key feature reform from the Uluru Statement, but Malcolm Turnbull gave very uninformed and irresponsible reasons for his rejection, which were basically that, first, the voice enshrined in the Australian Constitution, he said it would create a third chamber of parliament. Now, um, it wouldn't because it's an advisory body without veto power to the parliament, and it also doesn't sit within parliament. It is a voice advisory body to it. He also said that um, the voice would go against the rule of law and principles of equality. Um, and so to counteract that, it obviously, that statement ignores 250 years plus um, of, of Indigenous oppression um, from the Australian legal system and, and certainly ongoing disenfranchisement issues. And then he also said that it would be unlikely to be successful if it, if it were put to a referendum, which was at the time um, purely speculative and it ignored various surveys and statistics that confirmed the voice had increasing support from the Australian people. So his rejection was ultimately a political move to maintain the status quo. Um, but despite that, work on the Uluru Statement has continued forth and um, our public support as a campaign to so the Indigenous Law Centre that I work at, we work in partnership with the Uluru Dialogue Leadership um, to uphold the cultural integrity and mandate of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And so we run a very um, informative, educational-based campaign in Australia. And, and we've continued forth despite that. And it took a lot of hard work to um, put out the right messaging and understanding and information about what the Uluru Statement from the Heart and Voice to Parliament was about and how it would function. Um, but we've done that. And in doing so, um, we've gained further public support um, for a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. Now, after Turnbull's rejection and by 2018, a second joint select committee for this process was formed. We've had many committees formed throughout this over a decade process. Um, it's had about six or seven mini processes within it. Um, and, and so this joint select committee was formed, but it was an important one because its role was to examine the referendum council's work and in doing so, it found that the Uluru Statement was a game changer and the only way forward, but it needed more meat on the bones. It needed more detail. So after their report was delivered, and now by 2019, the federal election commitment um, for the Uluru Statement from the Heart included full endorsement for, from all major political parties um, in Australia. And so on those terms the government allocated $7.3 million for a two-stage co-design process to develop models of how the voice could look and function um, and then to consult on them and $160 million for a referendum. So those funds both sit in a contingency reserve. And to guide the process, members were appointed by our Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt, and he formed senior national, local and regional advisory groups to be a part and inform that co-design process. Now, skip forward to the beginning of this year, stage one of the co-design process is completed. So that was all about developing the models for this constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. And as part of that, an interim voice is um, released to the Australian public, which canvasses all of those options. So how the voice could look, how it could function, how it could link to local and regional levels of governance and and how it would um, communicate and have a dialogue with both the executive branch of government and the parliament. And then from there, so once that interim report was delivered, stage two of the co-design process commences, and that was all about consulting on those potential models. So consultation 
involved written submissions, answering an online survey, um, also attendance to um, by the public to consultation hearings, and they're all guided by members of those three voice co-design advisory groups, and that was coordinated by the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Um, and in addition, there were closed stakeholder consultation um, events that were convened. Um, now, the submissions round and public consultation events finalised about mid this year. After the completion of the co-design consultation process, um, myself, Professor Gabriel Appleby, and um, a research associate with the Indigenous Law Centre, Emma Buxton, the Minsk, we published on behalf of the senior Uluru Dialogue leadership and the Indigenous Law Centre, a counter report to the government. And we analysed and critiqued the process on, um, um, on behalf of the Uluru Dialogue leadership. And why we, why we did that was from the outset of the establishment of the senior advisory group and the voice co-design groups, there were concerns that the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt, had specifically ex excluded from the scope of the co-design groups terms of reference whether the voice should be established in the Australian constitution. And that was an important design feature of the voice. It's, a de it's design of its legal form. And the past decade of this process has always been a question about what form of constitutional recognition do First Nation people of Australia want? And that's been answered now. So the form is a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament to advise the Australian parliament and the government on laws and policies that affect First Nation affairs. And it's important because First Nation people have experienced obviously ongoing issues with the survival of various national Indigenous representative bodies in the past. Typically those bodies have been established in weak forms, either as a corporation or a legislative body, which has left them vulnerable to extinguishment and the whim of the government of the day. And their funding has either been cut almost entirely so that they're forced into voluntary administration um, or their establishing legislation is repealed to extinguish them and their replacement isn't prioritised. Um, so in noting time and that we um, have another speaker after myself, um, I'll just wrap up with where to from here. So um, at this stage of the campaign and co-design process, um, we're now waiting for the Australian government to release the co-design advisory group's final report, which will include findings from its co-design process. Um, so as we've waited for this report to be released, we've had many concerns from First Nation people who took part in the co-design process that the Australian government is not engaging properly with First Nation people to establish a voice body to represent them in good faith. They feel as though this co-design process has not properly adhered to international standards of good practice and standards of um, that are contained within the UNDRIP for designing an Indigenous representative institution. Um, and in effect, this has made many Indigenous people feel as though they're not being properly um, engaged with and included in this process nor heard, which of course doesn't bode well for a First Nations voice to Parliament. Um, so I might... Um, leave it there. I know I've gone over over a decade's worth of um, constitutional campaign history, but um, I'm really open to questions and invite feedback and questions on what I've just discussed. So thank you. Thanks, Tony. That was fantastic. Yeah, no, as you said, it's been going for at least 12, 13 years, the formal process of constitutional reform in Australia, and, and hopefully we're getting somewhere a little bit closer than we were previously. Um, thank you. I think one of the things that people don't often realise in Australia is there is no treaty, there is or, or treaties, there is no constitutional recognition, and so the position is um, very different from from um, in other places like Canada and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, that's not to say that everything is great in Canada and Aotearoa, New Zealand as well. Um, our next uh, speaker is Darcy Limburg, and Darcy is mixed roots Plains Cree with his family coming from Sampson Cree Nation in Alberta and the Battlefield area in Saskatchewan. He holds a BA from the University of Alberta and a JD, LLM and PhD from the University of Victoria, where he now teaches. Uh, so Darcy's research focuses on Cree law, ecological governance through Indigenous legal orders, gender and Indigenous ceremonies, comparative approaches in Cree and Canadian constitutionalism and Indigenous treaty making. And um, I haven't told him this, but I just got a book delivered yesterday and he's got a chapter in it, which is uh, quite, quite exciting. So I'm looking forward to, re to reading that uh, later. Uh, thanks, Darcy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Harry. And uh... Uh, I was like, I, mean, I didn't write a book yet. I, I was wondering where, what it would be, but uh, yeah, happy to contribute to that. I'm grateful to be a part of this panel and talk to you a little bit about 
um, Indigenous rights and Canadian law. Also, there's a mix up um, my, of my own making because I'm in Canada and I thought this was on Thursday. We're still it's still Wednesday where I'm at. So um, I had to rush back to the office to be a party here. So a little bit rushed. And in saying that, I do actually do have a, some slides. I'm wondering if I could share them, if I could get that. Uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, I think it, yeah. Um, it shares screen at the bottom should work. Yeah, OK, it's, it's great. Awesome. And I'm speaking to you. I, so as Harry said, um, I work at the University of Victoria. Um, and this is uh, on uh, Lekwungen territory, and I'm grateful to be a guest here on this lands as well. It's in Vancouver Island, for those of you who, am, who are familiar with um, Canada and, and the provinces. Um, and um, I'm going to take you on a bit of a whirlwind here. I'm just going to actually start the slideshow. And there we go. Is it, is it being shared? Yes, it is. There we go. Okay, awesome. Um, oh, it's on this side here. Okay, so I'm really going to talk to you about the Canadian Constitution, Indigenous Rights and Indigenous Laws. And um, we do have a source of Aboriginal rights, so the language is, is different here in Canada um, through Section 35. Did, did you see the slide change there? I, I, sometimes it gets... Oh, I'm going to have to restart it here, sorry. There we go. Um, so this is where the source of Aboriginal rights. So we talk about as Aboriginal law essentially here in Canada. Um, it's it's written to the Constitution since 1982, and this protection of Aboriginal and treaty rights um, is is in here. And so we have jurisprudence that has flowed out in the last um, 39 years um, that I'm sure everybody is well aware of here. That has really delineated these parts of. Um, the case law here in Canada. So we have Aboriginal rights, which is generally practices by communities where they've asserted their rights. Aboriginal title, um, uh, which is a claim to a territory. We actually have had only one um, declaration of Aboriginal title in Canada, and that was with the Chilcotin Nation as well. Um, and then treaty rights as well. And so um, here there's a number of treaties, both historical and contemporary across Canada, that Indigenous nations have made with the Crown. Um, and so uh, prior uh, for the last 39 years, generally when we talk about Indigenous rights in Canada, they'd flow through a Section 35 and they would kind of delineate out in, in these um, areas of case law essentially. And as a subsection of this, we do have a duty to consult as well. Um, and what that is, is it's, it's if there is an Indigenous nation has a claim of a right or a right to land. Um, and the Crown knows about it, um, there is a duty for consultation towards that Indigenous nation as well. So um, these areas become um, very, can um, the canons of Section 35 case law that we have here in Canada. Um, but what I really want to talk to you, so I'm not going to provide an update on this um, because each is, is, is varied on, on um, the way they've continued, especially the duty to consult um, becomes an area where we see a lot of litigation in Canada. The first three, not so much because um, it's so costly for Indigenous nations to bring rights cases and title cases forward. So for example, that title case, the Chilcote Nation case, um, it cost them $16 million and over 20 years for it to go from trial through the appellate levels right to the Supreme Court in Canada. Um, so it's costly. The duty to consult is a little bit more manageable. So we actually do see a lot of case law with the duty to consult um, and it becomes very um, particular and specialized in particular situations as well. Um, but what I wanted to really talk about has been this emergence in the last um, 15 years, especially of indigenous legal orders and its interaction with the common law and how it's carried indigenous rights forward as well. Um, so I always like to think about Aboriginal rights, Aboriginal title and treaty rights. Um, these are all underpinned by indigenous legal orders. Um, that uh, right to, for example, here on uh, where I am now to, to fish salmon um, is it's guided by the legal traditions of the nations who practice that here as well. And conversely, the right to govern land is, is underpinned by an Indigenous legal order as well. And so there's a lot of really promising and exciting work that is going forward with Indigenous um, legal orders here, um, especially uh, in, in, in light of a, a very devastating history that we have here in Canada with um, residential schools. 
Um, and we did have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that came out with these a num numerous calls to action, um, but these ones are particular to the legal community and the legal profession. And so part of this is to for law schools and law societies to engage with Indigenous legal orders um, and to recognize justice systems. And so we're seeing a lot of movement um, and more recognition of Indigenous laws proper and not just through Section 35, but on its own. So um, this is obviously the groundwork has been laid by um, a number of generations of people from Indigenous nations and communities. So I really appreciated um, Danny's um, talking about uh, the, the, the commitments there and that, that work that is there. And so underpinning all of these is the same thing that has gone on here in Canada. And, and uh, that's just more of the calls to action. But we actually saw this within the case law. Um, these are all Section 35 cases where we saw the courts starting to recognize Indigenous legal orders. So um, in, in, in these fundamental cases that we have here in Canada, talking about traditional laws, um, also customary laws. And so um, the underpinning there was for the emergence of Indigenous laws, Indigenous legal orders to really show up in the language of uh, the common law here in Canada. Um, so what we're seeing is, is we like to talk about it as a revitalization of Indigenous legal orders. Um, one thing that we, we know is that the source of Indigenous law is not from the Crown, it's from Indigenous nations themselves. That inherent right obviously sits there. Um, we also, I always like to note the agency of our nation. So for example, I'm Cree, as Harry had mentioned, and um, Cree law was asserted um, ever since there was intersocietal dealings with um, uh, European peoples coming into our territory. Um, and um, there was, we even had pronouncements in courts um, back to 1867 for that as well. We went in through a long period of, um, the, the clearest way to say it is deep colonization where indigenous legal orders were interrupted. And so we're really in this, this period of revitalization as that's occurring. And so we're seeing it in a number of areas. Um, one is through um, legislation. And so I'm not gonna read out or go through all of this, but this is actually where you see indigenous legal concepts, principles, laws um, uh, coming forth within acts. And so not only within provinces and territories, but also federal um, acts as well. And so here, so the most, the, the, I would say the most comprehensive has been Bill C-92. And this is an act to respect First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families. So it's a federal act here in Canada. Um, and, but it gives a broad authority to Indigenous nations if they take it up to draft their own laws, to administer and enforce them, to um, have dispute resolution mechanisms, um, to have paramountcy over federal and provincial laws. So um, really broad deference to Indigenous legal orders um, through that legislation. So that's one area when we think about legislation and the um, revitalization of Indigenous laws. Um, the second one, we see it just in case law. So we are uh, like um, the other jurisdictions, a common law, and we have civil law as well, but we have the common law here. So bringing cases forward and getting, um, as we talk about it in Canada, judge-made law, um, once a, a case receives a certain treatment. And so we've seen Indigenous legal ordering um, come through in a number of decisions. So it's important to note the date of these. These are all relatively recent. And, and so actually what we're seeing here in Canada is a number of nations have taken up their laws and are putting forward in trials um, right now. And so actually I always say within five and 10 years, we're gonna see this almost flowering of Indigenous law in our case law because these cases are, are starting to move through uh, the system. So for example, there's a huge treaty case um, where a nation is asserting their right to practice their laws um, uh, and that they've never um, given up this right. And so the courts are going to have to deal with that on this really large jurisdictional level uh, going through here as well. Um, and then we also have agreements as well. And so uh, we have here, this is just an example of one of it. It's uh, the Kunstagu Kunstea Reconciliation Protocol. And this is with the Haida people um, and Haida Gwai. So that's an island um, north of Vancouver Island here. And um, after a long struggle and some political and, and government negotiations, um, they came up with this agreement. So I, I like this one because you can see here in the preamble, the Haida Nation asserts its own title, ownership, and its laws and governance. 
And here, the province of British Columbia um, asserts its sort of assertion of sovereignty that we consistently see as well. So they're able to still assert those, but then they say, we're also going to work together on this management of this area as well. And so there's a way of intersocietal dealing that's really important here, where um, the Haida are using their laws, their governance, their politics to, to inform the practice here as well. So, um, so that is um, fruitful. Um, again, there's a lot of political strategy that goes on involved in there, but um, it's one area where Indigenous nations in Canada have been successful in, in getting some sort of deference or jurisdiction for their legal ordering. Um, and so I'll just finish off on what are some of the challenges when we think about Indigenous laws. Um, still, a, a number of Indigenous nations are in that hard process of recovery and revitalization of laws. Um, all are under-resourced and under-enforced in comparison to Canadian law, generally. And um, in the courts, there's, there, there's this need to adapt to receive evidence of uh, Indigenous laws. And so in Canadian courts, um, the, the, the judge is seen as the expert on all things law. Um, but we're finding that there's actually a, um, a discordance where really, quite honestly, our judiciary knows very little about Indigenous legal orders. And, and, and really relies upon people bringing evidence forward there as well. And so adaptation in these processes um, needs to occur and which it's doing. So, so really in that sort of hard work of the um, administrative uh, minutia of indigenous legal orders, um, but that work is, is still ongoing. So I'm gonna, I know that was a bit of a, a quick run through there. So I'm gonna cap it there because I know um, our time is short and, and really looking forward to questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks, thanks, Darcy. That, that was fantastic. Uh, another really great overview of what's going on in Canada, and I guess the, the differences um, uh, or the different ways that Indigenous nations are seeking to have their, their constitutional rights or the uh, rights of their own Indigenous legal systems um, recognised and protected. Um, so, people have been invited to put questions in the Q and I don't see any just at the moment, but please, if you do have any, um, please write them down. Um, in the meantime, um, I'll just wait a second. Otherwise, maybe what I might do is if there's if Valmain or Dani or Darcy would like to comment on any of the other presentations, they have, any questions they have for me for each other. I think it's always nice to have given opportunity to the presenters to ask their, their own question first rather than the, the hosts monopolize it. So if there is a if, if you do have a question for each other, please uh, go ahead. Otherwise, I, I, I've got lots of questions, but uh, I know we can't be here all day. No? Okay, well, I'll see if anyone will write a question in the Q&A in the meantime, but um, just, um, uh, Darcy, sorry, you did pique my interest at the last moment. They're talking about this uh, treaty case that's going to be coming before the courts, um, perhaps now or soon. I was wondering if you could speak about that for another minute or so, if that's okay. Yeah, for, for sure, Harry, yeah. So, um, so the context here is we have historical treaties here. We talk about them as historical treaties, um, and... Um, generally, uh, wide swaths of ter indigenous territories were um, a product or, or subject to these treaties, um, basically between 1867 and um, up until about 1910. So a relatively short time period, um, but really half of territorial Canada came under treaty in, in some sort of way. Um, so these treaties were often negotiated in three or four days, which... Um, for, that's amazing um, and terrible, I would say, uh, abysmal for Indigenous nations, right? Because um, um, the signing away purportedly in these um, of wide swaths of territory and rights occurred in such a little um, amount of time. So we have a special area of, I guess, jurisprudence um, in light of this is that um, for historical treaties, um, the courts are seeking a, a common interpretation but also are looking at a lot of extrinsic evidence. So not just what is written down in a treaty text, um, but like what was negotiated on because um, they were always in English, they were never in an indigenous language. Um, interpreters are generally were always provided by the crown as well. So there's a lot of um, um, inequity in, in their negotiations. And so this one case particularly is a historical treaty case um, where um, the crown says, you signed away your territory and we're essentially, we're damming this river on it. Um, and, and there's nothing you can do about it, if I can speak very plainly, but obviously it's in, in litigation language. Um, and the nation, what they're doing is they're saying, we never agreed in the negotiations to um, 
give away, first of all, all of this territory, but we also, um, we never agreed to give up jurisdiction for our laws, right? Our governance and our laws. And, and here's our practices. This is how we practice our laws on this whole territory, including where this dam is occurring. And so um, um, any sort of, any project that occurs on this river, and so this is the Peace River for those of you who know Canada. Um, it's within um, our nation's jurisdiction to make decisions on it essentially. So, so it's really exciting because they've, they've gotten to really nuance on like, we use our ceremonies, we have seasonal cycles here, um, we have hunting grounds, um, really relying upon a lot of different sort of institutions within our nation to make their argument on their laws. Yeah. Um, so that's just one, there's a number of other ones that are going on as well that um, because of the, just the complexity and what's at stake, it's really is going to be 10, 15 years before things get settled, but it's, it's a really exciting developments we're seeing in litigation. Sorry, I know that was more than a minute, my apologies. No, no, that's fantastic. Thank you. I, there is one question in the Q&A, but it, it is for you, Darcy. So I thought I might ask another question of another panelist first, sorry, <laughs> just to take that. But um, just drawing on what you're talking about, the, the difficulty of the judiciary trying to engage in Indigenous legal orders that maybe they haven't been trained in. I was wondering, Valmain, if, if you're able to talk a little bit about, um, I've been reading recently, um, I guess the the push to bring in to Kanga Maori into New Zealand common law, Aotearoa New Zealand common law, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about some of the challenges and and I guess what's going on from what you from your angle. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Um, actually, lots happening in our uh, courts with respect to Tikanga Maori. So, thinking about our lower level, our district courts, um, a new initiative is Te Ao Marama approach. So. It's taking the lessons from uh, specialist courts that are underpinned by therapeutic jurisprudence, which I think is also, you know, uh, tikanga Māori sort of uh, very similar analogies with. So uh, the chief, the um, head of our bench in the district court, he is um, piloting or promoting this Te Ao Marama approach where um, eventually there will be a, a holistic approach to not just judging, but also the whole process, substantive process and procedural process. So in a nutshell, I think he perceives all the courts at the district court level being underpinned by tikanga, which is really, um, really bold and really brave, but it's, it's exciting as well. So putting that to one side in terms of the district court, within our, um, within our judgments, we're also getting reference to tikanga Māori. And indeed, a lot, of our, a lot of our lawyers are including tikanga in their submissions. So then the court has to include, well, they, should, they don't have to, but they should include um, a response to that argument, including tikanga. Uh, our most, the most recent cases, the Alice case argued in the Supreme Court, where the concept of mana would be now applied to someone who is non-Māori. Um, and interestingly, it was um, um, Justice Glazebrook who um, was a, triggered or asked the question whether, where the, whether mana could apply to a non-Māori. So subsequently we had this wonderful, well, this wonderful sort of narrative around whether tikanga Māori and that concept of mana could apply to, to a non-Māori. So I think in, in a positive light, there is a, a lot of progression in that space for our judiciary to include tikanga, not just within our procedural court system, but also within the judgment writing space. Yeah. I could talk about that for hours, but I've been not. <laughs> no, 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 that's fantastic. I'll have to talk to you more about the Ellis case. I've been reading a little bit about it as well. So I'd, I'd love to have that conversation later. Um, there, there is one question in the Q&A uh, from Yuri. Uh, can you see that, Darcy? It's just, sorry, directed to you. I was just wondering. I can read it out, but I was wondering if you can also read it. Oh, yeah. I'll read it out for sure here. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, so it's a question about um, conciliation agreements. And um, there's a follow up on do I believe there's a potential for expanding this strategy to implement Indigenous peoples' rights consistent with international instruments, including UNDRIP and um, and then the American Convention on the Rights of uh, People's Influence in Canada. So really great question. Um, um, little multifaceted, but um, 
Yeah, conciliation agreements. Um, there, so we have this reconciliation protocol. Um, I love the framing of it as conciliation because that's generally the way I think about these agreements. Um, we need conciliation before reconciliation, but reconciliation is the word that we tend to use in Canada for these. But I think about them as conciliation, um, and it's kind of a product sometimes of like this is the best case at this moment, right? Um, so, for example, that that example I briefly talked about with the uh, Kunstea Kunstegu um, Haida Protocol, that reconciliation protocol, that was born out of a lot of opposition to um, logging that occurred in Haida territory, um, and um, and so it wasn't. And then also court cases that were starting to go through as well. Um, so it wasn't just something that the Crown was coming to the table and agreeing to. There was a lot of um, uh, work beforehand that I got there. And so um, often um, that sort of conciliation agreement, um, as you can see, even what I showed you, it's it doesn't dismantle crown sovereignty, which what the Haida would want to do, um, but it, it keeps it there, but it still has its um, uh, underpinning to, me, to move forward. So, so these conciliation agreements are good for moving forward. It gives certainty within um, communities as well. Um, for those as well. But uh, what we're seeing here consistently in Canada, which probably in other jurisdictions as well, is really this underpinning at all is um, some sort of conciliation of Crown sovereignty. Um, um, here, um, I'm in British Columbia, um, where mostly there isn't treaties, both historical or modern, but the Crown has asserted sovereignty over the land as well. And so Indigenous nations are really looking for that thing. And so, so they're kind of like the best we can do at the moment um, uh, question. Um, so I'll just answer the one on UNDRIP as well, is we're seeing movement here in different jurisdictions in Canada uh, on UNDRIP. The federal government did make some commitments through legislation to recognize um, those commitments in UNDRIP. Um, and then also in British Columbia, so the province that I'm in, um, uh, actually has similar legislation, but they're taking a longer process to look through all of their legislation and have it conform um, to UNDRIP as well. And so different jurisdictions are doing this as well. And then you have a subsection of a lot of dialogue amongst, um, for example, me, other academics on whether um, that sort of domestication process, whether it's going to um, essentially uh, denude the rights of that are in the international agreement, um, whether it can be fulfilled domestically, um, all those sorts of things. So it remains to be seen how um, UNDRIP is really um, influencing domestic law. Um, but um, here, British Columbia is taking the best approach where they're actually taking some time to look at all of their laws and, and try to conform or, or change. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Darcy. I've just got one question here from Peter as well. Just wanting to know if, if you're able to make your slides available to the people who registered um, for the um, panel today. If oh, yeah, and Darcy, sure. that's okay. Thanks. Yeah, if you yeah. could send them to me, I can then send them on to everyone. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we're running out of time. I've got one more question that I'd like to ask um, Dani or Director Dani here. Um, I guess the part of the discussion we've been hearing from Balmain and Darcy, I'm struck by sort of the a lot of this has been. The agency maybe is done by, by maybe younger lawyers, perhaps Indigenous lawyers who are pushing for recognition of uh, their legal systems, either through the courts or um, through conciliation agreements, as Darcy describes them, uh, and settlement processes uh, in, in, in New Zealand, in ATOR in New Zealand. Um, Australia is in a very different position with the lack of constitutional protection and the lack of historical treaty processes. And so the, the, the push, um, or the only real sort of um, substantial or significant push that's necessary is through a constitutional referendum where the entire country needs to vote on whether to recognise Aboriginal rights as through the order of statement. Um, I just wonder if Dani can talk a bit more about the challenges of a referendum process that she sees it, uh, um, not so much on the legal angle, but I guess the political angle and thinking maybe just how that has motivated the campaign or, or sort of motivate some of the challenges in the campaign. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Um, so... It's, it's pretty difficult. Like, I think the main sort of challenge that we're faced with is, um, you know, from the outset, Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt, um, limiting the scope of the terms of reference to take out the question of constitutional enshrinement of the voice to parliament. So what he's pushing for um, 
you know, politically is for a legislate first option. So he's saying, all right, we'll legislate the voice first through, um, say, the race's power of the constitution and um, we'll set it up that way. We'll see how it goes. And if it goes well, then maybe we'll constitutionally enshrine it. So politically, that would be unlikely to happen. Referendums are all about timing and moments, referendum moments. Um, we've gained a lot of like momentum in um, mobilising various different interest groups and, and putting all our ducks in a row to make sure we have, you know, that added 97% of non-Indigenous Australians vote um, for the referendum. So we've done a lot of hard work with the campaign to, to get the, the support that we need. Um, unfortunately, and, and one of our frustrations with even putting out the counter report was that um, we've effectively got a, a government here that's undertaking a co-design process. And because even after the submissions analysis that we looked at and the high statistics when we looked at all the public submissions made to this co-design process stating we want a voice constitutionally enshrined first, not a try before you buy racist sort of incremental constitutional reform strategy. We don't want that. We, want, we don't want First Nation people feeling like they have in, in past um, processes of establishing Indigenous bodies to feel like they're auditioning to see how we go and if the, if the body goes well, then maybe, but politically that never happens. There's no guarantee that the government would say, oh, like it's probably a justification for the government to actually in fact say, well, no, it's going well as a legislative body um, in this weaker form and so why would we constitutionally enshrine it? So much of the political strategization with the campaign now is pushing back on those messaging, um, those messages from our minister and, um, and, and sort of, I suppose, challenging those types of positions with um, just reflecting on the way in which Indigenous representative bodies have been created in the past. And I sort of talked about it before. It's either been through corporations, which have been, which have had to go into voluntary administration because they've lacked funding, or it's been, um, you know, when the when the bodies voice, you know, opinions from First Nation perspectives that challenge the um, political strategies um, and dealings that the government has with First Nation issues. And, you know, there's a bit of accountability there it puts those representatives, you know, under threat and at risk um, and the body itself at risk for taking an oppositional view. And so the political tactic is, oh, well, well, we'll just work out ways to um, dismantle it or disestablish it. We'll repeal its establishing legislation and, you know, maybe in another decade's time we'll establish another one exactly like that. So the lessons like I mean, the truth-telling component of this whole process and why each of those three pillars of the Uluru Statement are so important is, you know, we want to, we see the importance and value in treaty making and, you know, the voice was about, okay, let's have a protected constitutional status mechanism um, to, to give our voice members confidence but the necessary political legitimacy to intercept law and policy-making processes within those institutions and when doing so, it also sets us up for the necessary resources we're going to need for modern day treaty making processes, um, because we're going to need, you know, the best of the best silks <laughs> to go in and, you know, actually negotiate on our behalf. It's a very complicated process when treaties haven't been set up from the outset um, at first contact. So there's these, that's, the, the sort of deliberate sequencing with the Uluru Statement, it was about establishing the sort of political legitimacy and standing first and resources first, go in and start the treaty-making process with that. And, you know, alongside that, there would be truth-telling as well. But part of our, um, you know, I like what you say with conciliation because I'm like, you know, our point is, well, we've never met yet. <laughs> we, how can we reconcile when we've never met? We've, we don't have anything in place. And so um, I think, you know, just pushing back on those things, I mean, a lot of the political strategization too is um, they're trying to switch the sequencing of the Uluru Statement. So putting, you know, rushing through and doing treaties first and, and truth-telling processes first. But mob here are, are struggling because they're finding that even at a subnational level, the state and territory parliaments still have that political control and power um, in deciding, you know, even just how treaty frameworks within each jurisdiction 
um, are actually mapped out and most of them don't recognise, which is kind of, you know, to be expected, Indigenous sovereignty, but they also don't um, prioritise incorporating elders and persons of cultural authority to be in a, a part of and a, re, a really significant part of those decision making processes. So they're pushing back on these opportunities for like legal pluralism to exist. Um, so those are, those are just some of the political challenges. Thanks, Tani. I think that's right. Certainly, um, working in a federation can have advantages. There are also challenges in, in this, as I know you know, working in subnational reform um, as well. Um, Sorry to everyone, it's, um, we've gone a bit over 10 minutes over. I know everyone has other things to do. It's hard to get everyone uh, from all around the world uh, on a panel as this. So I, I apologise, we, we should finish now, but I want to thank again the panellists, uh, Valmain, Dani and Darcy, for uh, really engaging in an in informative uh, conversation about um, uh, just, again, I'm always struck by the consistency um, and the constancy, unfortunately, I guess, of the aims of Indigenous legal scholars and activists sort of asking for the same thing very, very clearly. Uh, and it's good to hear, I guess, in some places that the state is becoming more receptive to some of these, uh, either through uh, courts or through uh, conciliation agreements, through politics. Um, but it is sort of the, the consistency in claims and aspirations is, is so, so clear, I guess. Um, and so it's a real testament, I guess, to the strength of Indigenous nations continuing to for, the, for this struggle. So thank you again for everyone to presenting and thank you for everyone for attending. Um, the slides, I will send them off to um, the people who registered later on. Uh, and as Wes said at the start, uh, this has been recorded and it'll be released on YouTube and I'll send it around to everyone afterwards as well. So thank you.